My name is Eddie Ruiz, and I exist to help you sharpen your biblical mindset to help you love God and love others well. In our time together, we're going to be diving into the biblical concepts and biblical insights that we see with Logan Paul and Cliff Nectal during their conversation on the Impulsive Podcast. And just as a reminder, we're not here to hate on anybody in this video. They're all asking incredibly good questions questions, and it's important that we come alongside people who are still searching for faith in Jesus and help them and answer questions that they might have. Even though we might not have all the answers to all the questions, it doesn't matter. We should still partner with people and help them in their faith to take more steps. So let's dive right into the video. Beyond that prerequisite of acceptance of Christ into your, to your heart and a continued path of following Christ as a, as a way to uh, gain access to the kingdom of heaven. Um, are there any other prerequisites beyond that? Or on the flip side, what are some ways to get your ticket canceled? So Mike is asking a question that a lot of people ask, what are the prerequisites to get into heaven? What are the prerequisites for salvation? And I think it's a really honest question to ask if you're actually seeking uh, to know who Jesus is and you're looking into Christianity because so many talk about being saved but no one knows what it means to be saved. So it's a perfectly normal question. And I think it's a question that's actually really important to address. Prerequisites to salvation don't really exist. There's nothing you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to just go sell all your things or you're supposed to give everything to the poor or you're supposed to get rid of all the people in your life or there's nothing you're supposed to do to receive salvation outside of one specific thing. Jesus got this question a lot. A lot of people that would follow him and saw the signs and the wonders that he was doing would ask him things like, Jesus, what do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? It was a completely normal question. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are imprisoned at Philippi, and this incredible earthquake happens while they're in prison, while they're singing hymns and praising God. And as an earthquake happens, it flies the doors of the prison open. But the jailer that's supposed to be taking care of all the prisoners is asleep. And so what happens is the jailer wakes up and he realizes that all the prisoners can get out. And what happens? He takes his sword. He's about to take his life. And Paul says, hey, don't harm yourself. So the Bible says that the jailer brings them out and asks them, what am I supposed to do to be saved? Acts chapter 16 says it like this. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, and you and your household. So according to the Bible, the only requirement for salvation is confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior. It doesn't require a ton of work or things that you have to do in order to require salvation, because that would make salvation based on you and not Jesus. Romans 10, 9 through 11 says it like this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So therefore, it's important to remember that the only thing that saves us is belief in Jesus. It's nothing that we can do that saves us. It's what he did on the cross and in the resurrection that saves us ultimately, which Romans 3.28 calls justification by faith alone apart from works. And so we're saved by faith in Jesus, not by the work that we can do because none of us can work as hard as Jesus did. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about mortal sins today and, and, and how forgiveness applies to those. And especially uh, if you guys have any mortal sins that aren't listed, for me, uh, there's a guy on the plane today that was watching uh, YouTube videos with no headphones on full volume <laughs> of course. Uh, at six in the morning. And he was just, he, he thought it was okay to watch music videos, Latino music videos at six in the morning in full volume. I'm Puerto Rican. I love my Latino music. In my eyes, you go directly to hell. Like there's no coming back from that. I walked over, I said, hermano, this is not okay. They're love giving it. out free headphones. Why are you doing this to me? I feel like you're directing this direct. Shout out to the airline that gives out free headphones. I've never been on one that gives out free headphones. Me. So uh, what are what are the mortal sins that, that um, you know, people have to avoid or, or I mean, we know some of them I'm assuming murder and I learned about some of this, but a refresher. Yeah, can, can you can you list them out? And by the way, the mortal sin means if you commit this, you're you're doomed. You're not, there's right. no chance. And this is another great question. If you have a presupposition that there are prerequisites to faith, clearly you can lose that faith if there's something required to attain it to begin with. And what Mike is struggling in this question to understand is how can we stay saved 
if we commit more sin. There's some denominations out there that actually believe that you can lose your salvation from day to day just based on the sins that you commit. That you could be reading your Bible today, you can be praying, you can be loving others, loving God, doing the will of God, and the next day, if you do something grave enough and you have a car accident and die, you could spend eternity in hell because you lost your salvation. This is a term in theology known as the security of salvation or what Reformed theologians call the perseverance of the saints or perseverance for short. And the belief holds that based on what the Bible tells us, we cannot be taken out of God's hand once we are saved because faith didn't come from us to begin with. It implies that if you can lose your salvation, then salvation wasn't free to begin with. Even though Ephesians 2.8 tells us that it is a gift of salvation by grace through faith from Jesus. But the term perseverance sometimes gets confused and conflated with our work to continue in our faith. But what perseverance is actually ascribing to is that God has done a work in us, God is doing a work in us, and God will do a work in us. And Philippians 1 6 highlights this perfectly. It says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ implying and telling us that God started the work in us and he's faithful to complete it. So even if a believer struggles, and we will struggle, and we do struggle, because we're at the forefront of everything spiritual, spiritual battle is real, God is the one that's sustaining us in our faith. Through the Holy Spirit, we are encouraged and we are strengthened. And in one of the I am statements in John 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he highlights this truth so beautifully. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand and I and the father are one. With that statement alone and the seal at the end that Jesus is God because him and the father are one, no one can snatch us out of his hand. It doesn't say that if somebody would come and snatch them, I would give them over. It says that no one can snatch us out of his hand, securing our salvation. And here's a hard truth. Those that chose to fall away eternally, they made the decision to not follow Jesus, to not obey his commands, to not repent of their sin and follow him. It's a choice. But here's the beauty of the truth of Romans 8 that we should really take seriously and take to heart. It should be an encouragement to us. It says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. When Jesus was dying on the cross, two thieves were hung on either side of him. Yeah. They were criminals. They were guilty. The first thief turns to Jesus and says, come on, miracle boy, get us off these crosses. And then based on that, we'll believe in you. Second criminal mm -hmm. turns to the first criminal and says, you fool, we bleed and die here because we deserve it. But this Jesus, he's the innocent, holy, pure son of God. And the second criminal turns to Jesus and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, right there, Jesus' value system is on the line. He could look the guy in the face and said, get down off of here to say 12 Hail Marys work in a soup kitchen. And if you do a good enough job, maybe you'll make it. He didn't say that. Instead, he said, I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. And that I love this perspective. Grace without works, justified by faith in Jesus. The two criminals hanging next to Jesus are a perfect example of us today. Those who believe in Jesus and those who choose not to believe in Jesus. The one says, remember me in paradise. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. He recognized that Jesus was God. And the other one simply denied that Jesus was anything more than a mere criminal hanging next to him grace. That's amazing grace. God's undeserved offer of forgiveness, his generosity. Now, when you read the Gospels, and I would encourage you guys to read them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they're the eyewitness testimonies about Jesus, mm -hmm. what you'll notice is Jesus reserved his most scathing words for religious hypocrites. And the reason is because hypocrisy is pretending to be someone I am not. That's good. If I say that I believe in Jesus and talk with you about God and then walk out of here and seek to womanize, You'd point your bony finger in my face and say, Cliff, you're one flaming hypocrite. Mm. And you'd be right. Hypocrisy is one of those things that is so evident in scripture. And we see it now today. In fact, hypocrisy is one of those things that turns a lot of people off to Christianity because people say they believe one thing and then they live a completely separate way than what they say they believe. And so it's understandable when people are saying, man, y'all are a bunch of hypocrites. 
I would agree with them too. So hypocrisy can really ruin your relationships because you don't exemplify what you say you believe in. And remember, we're called to love others well. Jesus says, all of the law is summed up into these two commands, love God and love others. And so executing a very real vertical relationship with Jesus that affects our horizontal relationships with people. And 1 John 4 highlights the need to not be a hypocrite so well out of love for others. It says this, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. So don't be a hypocrite. Love God and love others well without an agenda in either of the two relationships. So Jesus points out that I'm not going to heaven because I live a good life. I'm going to heaven because of his grace, his offer of forgiveness. That's really good. But if my faith in him is genuine, it'll be shown in the way I love him, honor him, and obey him. Okay, this is a topic that really, really, really bothers people. For whatever reason, when it comes to obedience, the American people say, I don't want any of that. If it means that I have to lay my life down and obey anything, I just won't do it. We just don't like being told what to do. We're self-focused, we're self-centered, we're selfish. And that's why we don't like the word obey. But the reality is that Jesus's love language is obedience. And the way that we practically live out the free gift of salvation that he has given us is by just doing that, is obeying what he told us to do, which is to go make disciples, love God and love others well. And in John 14, in the context where Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit to his disciples, when he's going to go ascend to be at the right hand of the Father, to help them and equip them and encourage them to do the work of ministry and creating disciples, he says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And obedience in this context gets you such a deep relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. As you walk in his commandments, you read his scriptures, you're constantly interceding, you're praying, you're loving God, you're loving others. The deepening of your faith just becomes even more real and as you're conformed into the image of Jesus over time. That put a lot of, uh, I guess in this, the way you're describing so-called Christians or Christians at risk uh, because we are all imperfect Christians. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, do we all in some way become those uh, religious hypocrites that you're just yes we are imperfect christians because we are imperfect people that serve a perfect god so true so you and i are playing ball together you block my shot when you land i elbow you i say man i'm really sorry would you please forgive me you say yes cliff thank i, I forgive you secondly you block my son shot a second time you come down and boom i elbow you All right. which by the way in this interview cliff says that he wanted to play college basketball professional basketball and he wasn't good enough, but he's really tall. Either I'm a hypocrite or I got a bad habit with my temper. A Christian is someone who has bad habits and I got a bunch of them. I've had to pray for forgiveness for my pride, for my greed every day, almost basically. It doesn't mean I'm a hypocrite. It means I got some bad habits. Hmm. A hypocrite is someone who's playing a game, a stupid game. If I say to you, I'm sorry for elbowing you, but I can hardly wait to do it again. You don't have to have a PhD in psychology to figure out this is one hypocritical dude. Cliff does an amazing job communicating the truth of the human experience that we are naturally born sinful and have a bent towards sin that even when we walk with Jesus, we still have that ingrained in our DNA. And even though Jesus has set us free from the bondage of sin, we still struggle with that type of hypocrisy on the inside. And we have to choose to go to war with it and combat it every single day. And trust me, I have three little ones, 10, six, and four, and I completely understand how sin is just deeply ingrained in us because from an early age, you gotta teach your kids to say yes instead of no. You gotta teach them to be kind and share instead of wanting to take things away from kids and fight and argue. And that's not something that they're taught. That's just something that they do naturally because we have a natural bent towards sin. And it's just a small glimpse of that ingrained DNA that's sinful. Paul highlights this truth really well in Romans 7 with regards to sin. He says, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And so inside of us, we have a desire to do well, but we just don't because of sin. And the things that we don't wanna do, we do those really well. But he highlights the very opposite, just one chapter before in chapter six, where he says that we're dead to sin and alive in Christ. He says it like this. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under 
grace. That is the good news of not having a prerequisite to faith, that faith comes from believing in Jesus, that all sin was canceled and we're not under the bondage of sin anymore. There's no mortal sin that can separate us from the love of God and that salvation was a gift to begin with. And out of that faith, we obey Jesus and the command to love God and love others well. Thanks for spending some time with me unpacking the biblical insights in this awesome interview. Honestly, it was fantastic from beginning to end, but it's also two and a half hours. And I feel like this video would have been four and a half hours if I would have done the whole thing. So if you want to see more from this interview and unpack the biblical insights, let me know in the comments below because we would love to get after it. And I pray that this video helped you think a little bit more biblically about the world around you because we are going to be faced with these challenging questions and we need biblical answers to apply them to everyday life. And we're going to have conversations like this, like what Mike and Logan are having with Cliff and Stuart. And it's so important to just be ready for those conversations. And those conversations should be welcome and they should never be a deterrent to someone's faith and they should never be a barrier for you to have in your conversation. And with all that being said, remember, Remember, keep it biblical, and I'll see you in the next one.